Hello everyone and hope you're having a great Tuesday and you've got all your turkey eaten after Thanksgiving. I'm so glad that you're here with me online and uh, if you got your Bibles turn to James chapter 1 and we're going to start reading in verse number 2 but before we dive into the Word of God just want to pray about a few things. Uh, last week was uh, a year anniversary from the attacks in Israel, and we need to continue to pray for peace in Israel and for those hostages to get released and back with families. Uh, so we pray for Israel. And then uh, praise the Lord. We had a great Sunday, a wonderful Thanksgiving Sunday. Visitors out. Uh, always encouraging to see that. Uh, so let's be praying for our church family as well as we, we're starting to see those cooler temperatures. I had to put on a warmer jacket today to, when I came out to work and things. And it's the time of the season change, so that means it's cold and flu season too. So uh, let's be in prayer for one another. Our church family, I know some folks that have suffered with that. I was sick with the cold last week and flu, whatever uh, it was. So uh, let's be in prayer for our church family too. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for another day given to us and thank you for your many blessings. And uh, Lord, we look to you to strengthen uh, our church family, thank you for a wonderful Thanksgiving Sunday and visitors out and great spirit, great time of fellowship following the service and great message from Brother Rogers uh, about Thanksgiving and being thankful. And I want to pray you just help us to continue to have that heart all the way through the year, not just on that one weekend in October. And Lord, I pray you'd help us uh, as a church family as well. Uh, time of the year, season's changing, uh, flus and colds going around, protect us. Give us your strength. Lord, I pray you be with the situation in Israel. And uh, Lord, so many uh, hostages still being uh, in captivity. Lord, we look for their release. And Lord, pray for peace in Israel and Jerusalem. Lord, I pray you be with uh, that whole situation there and give wisdom to leaders to bring out uh, just outcomes. Lord, I pray that you would Lord, help us to be a testimony to all the world of your love. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so James chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse number 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is, in, is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he's exalted. For the rich, but the rich, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen from the burning heat, but is withered, withered the grass, and the flower thereof faileth, and the grace of the fashion of it, it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. You probably have seen on a bumper sticker or uh, you know, maybe in a newspaper or something, when life hands you lemon, make lemonade. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a funny saying. It's something that we smile about, though it's much harder to practice. Uh, and it's, it's biblically sound. When we have trials that come our way, we should, you know, those, it looks like it's going to be a defeat. We can see it turn into a victory, and we are to become victors rather than victims. That's what the Lord wants for us. And, and James tells us, you know, there's trials that are going to come, Okay. From the outside, that's what we're looking at, verses 1 to 12 here. I read verse 1 last time. But we see temptations from our trials from without. And then the next time, Lord willing, uh, we'll see from temptations on the inside. So through all of these things, we can have victory. And the result of that victory, we, we get those victories because of spiritual maturity. Because we're growing in the Lord. And that's what's being talked about as we go through the book of James. So what are some essentials for us to to get the victory in the trials that come our way. First of all, in verse 2, we see a joyful attitude. Number two, uh, verse number 2, a joyful attitude. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. So your outlook definitely determines your outcome. 
If you, if you have a good outlook in a sense that you're looking to the Lord and your attitude determines your actions, how you, how, what kind of attitude you have determines what you do. If you have a bad attitude, usually bad actions. Okay. And God tells us to expect trials. It's not if, if you fall into various testings, but it says when you fall, uh, you know, count all job when you fall into divers temptations. So it's not, it might happen. It will happen. All right, so we need to be, we need to understand as believers, I think we do understand this, but just to reinforce it, reality is not easy. Real life is not easy. There's lots of things that are hard, and, and Jesus warned his disciples too that there would be tribulation uh, in John chapter 16, verse 33. And Paul told his converts that we must, uh, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, as Christians, we're not sheltered in the sense that God puts this big hedge around us and nothing happens to us. That, that's not reality. We will experience trials. Uh, we can't always expect everything to go our own way. That, that's, not, that's not reality. And some trials that come to us uh, simply happen because we're human. We get sick, okay? That, that just happens because of life. Uh, accidents can happen. If you drive in Brampton, you see lots of accidents. <laughs> and there's disappointments. Uh, I know uh, a couple of years ago, we were looking to go to Hawaii for a family vacation. It didn't work out. And I was disappointed. That's not a trial. It's just disappointments. All right. And, and so forth. Those things happen. But there's other things that happen to us because we are Christians and we stand for truth. Uh, beloved, this is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning fire trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. There, if we stand for truth, if we're going to be biblical, the world's going to be opposed to us. I mean, they might be complacent and not say much, but there will be those in the world who would attack biblical things. And we know the enemy definitely attacks it. All right, so it's going to happen. There's going to be conflict. And the phrase fall into there in verse 2, uh, it means to encounter, to incur. Uh, a Christians certainly should not manufacture trials or troubles for ourselves. Okay, we we don't need to we don't need any more. All right, we shouldn't do that. Uh, the Greek word translated divers means various or very colored. So the trials of life are not all the same. So if you've been a Christian very long, you've been you know you've lived very long, you know that there's different trials that come. They're not always the same one. So they vary and, and they're. So I read a story, I couldn't find it for the message, but of, uh, of a lady talking about, she was looking at the backside of a rug and how it looked all nasty, but you turned it over and you looked and it looked so pretty that the detail was all there, the yarn and things. So all the yarn, you know, she was making a reference that all the yarn was different colors representing different trials and the final product is a thing of glory. It's beautiful. Well, the Lord's not finished with us yet. He's still working through us and he's letting us, you know, work through those things. We're not a finished work. And then we see the word count uh, is, is a financial term, means to consider. Paul used it several times in the book of Philippians. When Paul became a Christian, he evaluated his life and, and there was new goals. There was new priorities. Uh, he lived, or sorry, there, things were, that were once important to him were no longer important to him. Now he was... They were insignificant in the light of Christ and what Christ wanted him to do. Uh, so that this, he's looking at it through those eyes. And so when, so as a Christian, uh, we're going to face those trials, but we can have that joy, count it all joy when we fall into divers temptations. Even our Lord was able to endure the cross because of joy that was set before him. If we value comfort, I, this is not original to me. I read this in the book and I thought it was really good. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. If we value comfort, if comfort's what we live for rather than character, then we're going to be upset. And if we value material and physical more than spiritual, we won't count it all joy because it's painful and it maybe takes away from the physical. And if we live only for the present and forget the future, then trials will make us bitter, not better. You know, that, that's the way it works. Uh, so we need to have that joy, a joyful mind, a joyful attitude. 
Verse number three, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So what do Christians, so this is an understanding mind, number two, an understanding mind. What do Christians know that makes it easier to face trials and benefit from it? And the answer is faith. With a faith. Faith is always tested. It's always tested. When God called Abraham to live by faith, a faith he tested him in order to increase his faith. And Abraham, if you read his life, had numerous uh, testings, uh, various degrees. And the Lord was testing him. God always tests us. This is a good thing for us to remember. God always tests us to bring out the best. He brings those testings to bring out the best. Satan tempts us. So it's a different word. Test by God to bring out the best. Satan tempts us to bring out the worst. That's his desire. By testing our faith proves that we're born again and it's a proof positive of that salvation, you know, we've accepted Christ. Trials work for believers. It's not always pleasant. I'm not saying that you can't wait for it to happen again, but it helps us grow in our faith. Uh, Paul said in Romans 8, 28, and we know all things work together for good. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, it says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What does uh, God want to produce in our lives when he brings these testings to us? Well, he wants us to be, have more patience or grow, endurance, long-suffering, and, and, uh, and that kind of goes with the idea of keep going when things are tough. When things are rough, we keep going. We glory in tribulations, Romans chapter 5, knowing that tribulation work with patience and patient experience, and experience hope. In the Bible, patience is a courageous perseverance, just staying at it in the face of hard times, in the face of difficulties, in the face of suffering. You just keep plodding along, just keep doing what's right. So uh, I kind of alluded to this last time we, we had a Bible study, was immature people are impatient. They go hand in hand. Immature people are impatient. Mature people, I mean, we all have a limit. I understand that. But mature people have a whole lot more patience. They're not impatient. They're in, in, impatient. And they're persistent. That's, that's a, a mature person. Impat impatience and unbelief, they're kind of like uh, buddies. They go together. Okay? And just as faith and patience are buddies, they go together. Uh, be followers of them through through faith and patience. Uh, inherit the promises. That's in Hebrews chapter six, verse twelve. A little children who uh, a little child does not uh, learn patience. If they don't learn it. Will never learn much of anything, will they? You need to have patience to focus on a task. You need to have patience to maybe there's a concept that's difficult. You need to work at it. Maybe you got to try a different path to get to understand the truth. But you you have to have patience. Patience is needed. Uh, you know, when I do a message up, it, it takes some patience. Sometimes I got to work through what, is the, what does this mean? And I'm looking for something else to help me understand it. It takes patience to develop, maybe at your work. It takes patience to work through those things. Patience is needed. When a believer learns to wait in the Lord, now that's when God can do great things for him. Uh, there's times when Abraham did not pass the test. Uh, I think of when he ran ahead, the Lord told him he was going to have a child and he would be, his child would be the father of a nation or you know, his son. He went ahead and married Hagar. Well, that wasn't God's plan and had a son. Created all kinds of sorrow in his house because of that action. Moses ran ahead of God. He found out that he was going to be the deliverer and he murdered an Egyptian. Well, that wasn't God's plan. That's not how God wanted things to go. And he ended up spending 40 years tending sheep before he learned that patience to lead. And only the only way the Lord can develop patience and character in our lives is through trials. Endurance cannot be attained by you and me reading a good book about whatever uh, or us listening to a sermon. Listen, reading a good book and listening to sermons are good things. They're good, but they're not going to, you know, we can't attain endurance through it. We must go through the difficulties of life. We need to trust God. We need to obey him. And then the result of that will be patience and character. Okay, knowing this, that we, 
you know, this is what the process is. We can face that trial knowing the Lord's in control. I can have joy in the Lord. I might not enjoy the experience, the trial, but I have joy in the Lord because I know he's with me and I know that he has, a, there's a purpose for all this. You know, God has a plan and I need to follow him. And knowing that the end result of this situation is glory for God. That, that's the end result. Uh, this fact explains why the Bible does aid us in growing in patience. We read about Abraham, Joseph, Moses, and David, that they had trials and problems. We see God had a purpose for all those things. And they're not just the, the few elite that have that. All of us have purpose. Everybody has purpose in God's plan. And God will fulfill his purpose as we trust him. It's critical that we trust him. You know, it, it's so important. You know, Satan can defeat um, the ignorant believer very quickly. A believer who's not in the word, who's ignorant to the truth. But he can't quickly overcome a Christian who knows his Bible and understands the purposes of God. Not to say that we're, uh, you know, we, we, we are over better than Satan or anything. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is that when we're grounded in the word, we get protection and we understand which way God wants for us. So we're not as easily fooled or led astray or confusion because we know what the word of God says. As the, the ignorant believer does not know what God's word says, so it's much easier for him, him or her to be led astray. All right. So then we see a surrendered will, verse four, but let patience have her perfect work that we may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Then verse number nine, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he's exalted, but the rich in that he has made low because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away for the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but is withered, the wither of the grass and the flower thereof falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And so a surrendered will. We can't not build, we, God cannot build our character, and God wants our character to grow, but he can't grow our character without our cooperation. We have to follow. If we resist him, he'll chasing us into submission just probably like if you remember as a child you didn't do what your parents told you they they got you in line so shall we say get you to do what's right but if we submit to him in those moments you know of trial and things he can accomplish his work so much quicker he's not satisfied with a halfway job he wants us to be totally surrendered he wants to finish the project he wants us to be complete is talked about there. He wants us to be finished, entire wanting nothing. That's what he desires for us. God's goal for our lives is maturity. That's what God wants. A couple weeks ago, uh, we, a couple Sundays ago, I should say, uh, we had some uh, young people, a baby, a young girl get uh, dedicated in our church. And there was all kinds of, all kinds of babies in our church. And we're thankful for the kids that are here. But wouldn't it be like horrific if you left Legacy Baptist Church for five years and you came back and those babies were still babies? You'd be like, what's, what's going on? There's nothing. In that little one's not supposed to be, when I left a year or five years ago, it was one and it still looks like it's one. There's a problem. It would be hor horrible to see that remaining babies. We enjoy watching them mature, right? Uh, I know there's, there's one little fellow in our church. It's so good to see him. He's growing up little by little and see him walking around like he owns the place. He's growing, he's maturing, and that's what needs to take place, okay? And we need to do the same things uh, in our lives. And, and watching that child grow, there's going to be difficulties as they grow, right? It's, it's not all fun. There's difficulties in mastering things, but there's delights too as they succeed, as they grow. And many Christians, uh, they almost want to have a shield to shelter themselves from all these trials, and again, we're not looking to manufacture them, okay? But there's trials that will come. And if we kind of shield ourselves from that, we miss the opportunity to mature, to grow more in our faith. God wants his children to grow up, to be the believers 
that the Lord would have for us. God builds character before he calls to service. We have to demonstrate character. We wouldn't throw someone in the pulpit who can't show up to church every week. You know, we need, we need to see that they there's some character. There's maturity. They're grasping the word of God. He must work in us before he can work through us. We got to be growing, maturing, having that deeper walk with the Lord. And we can see examples of that in the word of God. God spent 25 years working in Abraham before he gave him his promised son. Okay. God worked 13 years in Joseph's life. I think of Joseph and, man, the trials he went through, the various, and, and they were large and different, each one. And he just kept faithful before he was, for those 13 years, before he was placed on the second highest seat in the land. But I've got to be wondering, those 13 years, he must have felt pretty bad. Like there was a lot of growing up and maturing that took place. I mean, uh, the Lord worked on it. Moses for 80 years for him then to serve the nation of Israel for 40. I mean, just that's what God does. But God can't work in us without us consenting or submitting to him. There must be a surrendered will. The mature person doesn't argue with God's will. There could be times where we're like, Lord, is that really what you want me to do? I mean, we, we, we do face those insecurities that time, I understand, but we're willing to follow him. You know, and for us to be a little hesitant, I think that's just human nature, but we still need to follow. Follow which way the Lord wants us. Accept it willingly and obey it. Doing the will of God from the heart. You know, have you ever thought what occurs if we try to go through trials without surrendering our will, there's a great example of that in the Bible, and it's Jonah. Jonah. So I think, you know what, but we'll go real quick, recap it real quick. Jonah, God calls him to go preach to a wicked Gentiles at Nineveh. He said, nope, I'm out of here. Hits the coast, gets on a boat, you know, big storm, gets swallowed by a whale, gets to Nineveh. God chastens his heart, and he accepts it. But Jonah didn't obey God from the heart. He, he obeyed and he went, but he didn't grow in this experience. And you could say, how do you say that? Well, the last chapter of Jonah, the prophet is acting like a spoiled brat. Okay, he, he's sitting outside the city. He wants to see it destroyed. That doesn't sound like a prophet I want to be around. <laughs> he, rather than revival, which did take place, he wants to see the place burned to the ground. And so he's upset that that doesn't happen. He's, uh, uh, he's impatient with the sun. The wind blows. The gourd, the worm eats the gourd. He gets upset. And he's upset with God. And that's how the chapter, the book ends. I mean, it shows to us that he, he didn't learn to the experience. I mean, he should have been rejoicing. It wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been so great if Jonah ended with him returning to Nineveh and helping them understand the truth even more. But he, that's the way he reacted. And one difficult stage of maturing is weaning as a child. child being weaned is sure or thinks the mother no longer loves him or her and is against them. But actually weaning is a step toward maturity, the growing up of liberty. It's good for the child, but at that moment, the child is like, this is the worst day ever. Mom's not, mom doesn't love me anymore. And sometimes God has to wean his children away from childish things, um, Immature attitudes. Uh, we, we, need it, we need that weaning as well. God uses trials to wean us away from those things. But if we don't surrender to him in those trials, we become even in, more immature. We can end up like Jonah, complaining about everything, pouting, upset with God about no judgment. I mean, we need to make sure that we're submitting to the Lord. I'm not going to read the verses again, but verses 9 through 11, James applies this principle to two different types of Christians, the poor and the rich. Apparently there was some uh, of those both in, and both uh, in the societal realms, both the poor and the money status and things were problems among these people. And he says, God's testing levels everyone out. It doesn't matter. You know, the, the, the poor comes and he let God have his way and can rejoice that he possesses spiritual riches that cannot be taken away, can help him get through that trial. And when tough things come to the rich man, he can also let God have his way and rejoice that his riches is in Christ, which cannot wither or fade away. 
You know, in other words, it's not your material riches that take you through the testings of life. It's your spiritual resources. That shows maturity. Rather than trusting physical, we're tr trusting the spiritual. We're start trusting the Lord. Verse number five. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he, may, he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When we are going through God-ordained difficulties, James tells us, ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. And James has a great deal to say about wisdom as we go through this book. He'll, he mentioned this many times. And the Jewish people, and remember this is the main focus, is the tribes that are scattered. It's, it's, it's focus is for us too, but the main focus, the, the intended reader, was Jewish people. And they were lovers of wisdom. Okay, The book of Proverbs gives evidence of that. I don't know if you know this, but Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs. I mean, incredible amount. We don't have them all. There's so many he wrote. Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. Now, I have met some people who are incredibly intelligent, like very, very smart, brilliant academically. Like I sat in class with them and I'm struggling to write everything down and they're like, it's like it all just got trapped in their head and they can take, they can repeat it at the test and they're getting 4.0 grade point averages and I'm just squeezing by. All right. <laughs> I know people like that. And at the same time, they have a hard time just making, making the simplest of decision, life decisions. And, and so the idea is that we need, why do we need wisdom when we're going through the trial? Why not ask for strength or grace or even deliverance? We need wisdom to help us not waste the opportunity that God gives us in maturing us. Again, the focus of James is a spiritual maturity. And that's not to say we don't, we don't ask for strength or grace, but he says ask for wisdom first. And you know, the Lord has a, there's a plan here. Wisdom helps us understand how to use these circumstances for good and for God's glory. James not only explained what to ask for wisdom, but then he asked, uh, described how to ask. We ask in faith. You know, your God will never turn away the prayer of a Christian who says, Lord, give me wisdom. He will not turn that away. That you're always in God's will when you ask for wisdom. That that's absolutely what God wants. We don't have to be afraid. Uh, I, I pray to the Lord. I'm never afraid. Lord, please give me wisdom. I don't fear that. I'm like, Lord, give me wisdom. I know you want me to have more. I want you, I know you want me to be more mature spiritually. And I need that wisdom to be more mature. For God. He, he wants us. He won't be upset with that request. Uh, James compares a doubting believer to the waves of the sea. Up one minute and down the next. And, and you don't know which way you're going. And growing up uh, along the coast, I've been in lots of boats, big and small. And uh, you know, you, you are never to uh, trust the waves as such that you think it's all fine. No, you got to be always watching. Uh, I, I can remember times in big boats, uh, up and down and side to side and little boats the same thing and even sitting along the sand on the shoreline uh, you would never just sit in a rock and totally forget about the waves you always had to keep an eye because the waves are always different and one minute you're sitting on the rock nice and dry and the next you're soaking wet by the north atlantic and it's cold okay you know and you never turn your back to the waves because you never know which one's going to come the experience of the double-minded man is the faith says yes but then Unbelief says no, and then doubt says yes, and then the next is no. And it's, uh, I've seen many Christians uh, live like um, the bottle that is floating in the sea. One minute it's up and it's down. I can't remember how many times we threw pieces of wood and cork into little bays growing up. And we watched it go up and down, up and down, all the way out of the bay. Uh, you know, being tossed back and forth. That's not maturity for us as believers. That, that, that's evidence of immaturity. You know, if one minute, if, if, if I'm talking to Rainbow one minute and I'm, I'm happy, then the next minute I'm yelling at Rainbow because I'm so mad, that's immaturity, right? That's what we would say. That's an immature person. Can't control their emotions. 
So uh, the, that, that's evidence of immaturity up and down like that. Paul used a similar idea in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If we have a believing and united heart, we can ask faith, in faith, say, God, give us wisdom. We need it. We need wisdom to know what to do next and how to live our life the best. So we've been talking about immaturity and we need to grow. So immaturity and unstableness or instable, they go together. And we don't, God doesn't want us that way. These verses tell us he wants us to be stable, not double-minded. All right, that's what he wants from us. In verse number 12, it says, Blessed is that man that endureth temptation. This is a beatitude, it's a great encouragement, and it promises, uh, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. All right, the promise of the crown to those who patiently endure trials. He's not saying that a sinner is saved by enduring trials. He's saying that believer is rewarded by enduring trials. Okay, there's only one way of salvation, and that's through accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the beginning point, and then forward we grow, mature, and be stable in the Lord. And that, so, how is that Christian rewarded? First, by Christian character. Christian character. That is more important than we give it credence. We need Christian character. We need to have it. He's rewarded also by bringing glory to God by being granted a crown of life when Jesus Christ returns. And then there's suffering, that, that that's the glory for the Lord. God does not, you know, he brings these things into our lives, these testings to, to make us grow and to be more stable and mature in him. And so the testing comes to build us up. Satan wants to test us, tempt us, to tear us down. But again, God wants to build us up. And verse 12 is a last part there. He uses the word love, that love him. Maybe some people would expect him to say the crown of life which the Lord promises and that trust him or that obey him. Why did James use love? Because love is to be the spiritual motivation behind every command in this section. We need to love. Why do we have joyful attitudes as we face trials? Because we love God. And we understand those trials are from God and he's wanting us to build us up. He's not, the, he's not one, he doesn't, he doesn't not, not look to harm. Now there's things that will stretch us and it won't be comfortable, but he's not looking to harm us. Why do we have a surrender will? Because we love him. Where there is love, there is surrender and there is obedience. When you love someone, you trust him or her and, and you don't hesitate to have, Ask them uh, for help, or her, him or her for help, because you love one another. And there's another factor, love keeps us faithful to the Lord. And so we don't have that double-mindedness. He wants us to love him. He got, that double-mindedness can be an uh, attribute of us loving God and, love, and trying to love the world at the same time. That's double-minded, and we're going to be unstable. We're going to be cast to and fro. The Christian who loves God and who knows that God loves him, won't fall apart when God permits trials to come. Again, I'm, I'm not saying that you, it will be easy, because it won't. The trials are difficult. But we won't go to pieces, because we know that God is in this. He's secure in God's love. He's not double-minded, uh, and trying to love both God and the world at the same time. We think of the Old Testament. Lot tried that, didn't he? He looked to Sodom and he saw the plains and things and he had spent years with Abraham and I'm sure Abraham taught him many good things and he saw Abraham's faith at work but he saw Sodom and that's where he went. And he, I mean, he ended up with losing his wife, all his family except for two daughters. That's not how he had that planned out. Abraham was a friend of God. He loved God. He trusted him. Did he fail? Yes. Was there testings? Yes. But God was with him, and at the end, Abraham triumphed, and we saw his faith grow, growing each time with each uh, test that came. God's purpose 
in trials, and they come, that's what it says in, in verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. It's not going to be, oh, what? This happened. These things will happen. And uh, you know, his purpose is to build us up. It's to mature us. Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. All right? So I hope that's helped you understand God's purpose there and how we should react, that, that joyfulness, understanding, that surrendered will. Uh, hey, we, I want to grow in my life. I want to mature. I need those things in my life. So next week, we'll be examining uh, this chapter again, chapter 1, verses 13 to 18. So at your homework this week. Read those things up and just help you prepare for the next lesson. The more you know about the verses that we're going to study, the more impactful this will be. As you, you know, take in the word of God, read it over. Hey, read it over once a day. It's only a few verses. It's not crazy. And read it over and it just helps you as we next week uh, look at those uh, verses. And as we go through uh, the book of James in, in this study, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And I'll do my best to find out that answer for you. I want you to grow in your faith, to mature. And that's what God's word tells us. And that's his desire of this writer, James, for us to mature in our Christian life. So don't, ho don't hesitate. Send me a message and I'll try to answer those. And uh, maybe uh, uh, next week, if someone sends me a uh, question this week, I might answer it at the beginning of next, uh, just so we can... Maybe someone else has the same question, but maybe they're afraid to ask. I, I don't know, but we'll, we'll get those answers to you. All right, so let's close in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for another opportunity we have to look in your word. I pray that this indeed has been a help and a challenge to us. Uh, Lord, help us to look to you in those trials. And Lord, we know you love us and help us to love you as we should. Lord, I pray you watch over us. Give us a great week now. Help us to grow in our faith. I pray in Jesus' name.